Hello, and welcome to another episode of Chatter, a podcast from the Jets. This is our first episode of 2018. It's nice to be back. It's great to have our first guest from 2018. It's actually an interview we recorded at the end of last year before we took a little break. Uh, it's with Professor Colin Harvey of Queen's University Belfast. We spoke all about the Good Friday Agreement, the implications that has for Brexit, and the most recent agreement made between the EU and the UK. We also spoke about the possibility of a Citizens' Assembly for Northern Ireland, which has become significantly more relevant in the past week or two, given the now supposedly advanced discussions regarding the possibility of using a Citizens' Assembly to advance some causes and issues that have been stagnating Northern Irish politics. If you enjoy the show, don't forget you can like us on Facebook and Twitter. You can subscribe to us on iTunes. And most importantly, you can tell all your friends about the show. So here's Colin Harvey. So, so Colin, thanks, thanks for agreeing to chat to us. Yeah. It's a pleasure pleasure to be here. I read your uh, your piece in The Telegraph yeah. and uh, was intrigued to have you kind of unpack a little bit more what you meant about the what last week's deal or I don't know if you'd call it a deal yeah Yeah. especially if you're listening to David Davis but what last week's agreement meant for Northern Ireland's constitutional status um, as part of the UK or as part of Ireland so uh, do you want to give us um, a little bit of an overview of of your your, your thoughts on that? Well I think first maybe helpful just to explain that I'm involved in a project at the moment a ESRC funded project looking at the consequences of Brexit for Northern Ireland. Uh, we're called Brexit Law and I, and we're a partnership between Queen's Ulster University and the Committee for the Administration of Justice. And we're looking at the consequences of Brexit for this society across a range of areas, including the peace process, North-South relationships, and issues around human rights and equality. So it's really in that context that I've been engage, engaging with some of the, these questions. Uh, we have provided a preliminary analysis of, of what's happened last week. It might be helpful if I spoke through some of those points in relation to that, but, but more general reflections. I think, you know, important to bear in mind that last week is a, a joint report between the EU and UK negotiators really setting out the position so far with a range of commitments in that report that may end up in the final withdrawal agreement. Then a number of things stand out, I think, about the report. I think one is it it really is quite remarkable how central the Belfast Good Friday Agreement is to that joint report last week. It's really striking when you look at the, the separate section in relation to the issues of Ireland and Northern Ireland. There's clearly then a number of guarantees that are written in to that joint report and commitments. And we've seen over the weekend and since there's been a bit of a debate and an argument as to the status of those commitments, an argument around the language that is used. Nothing is agreed until everything agreed. But there are certain commitments in Ireland, Northern Ireland section that look very binding indeed. You know, they look like hard commitments in terms of the different scenarios that are sketched out. I think from the work that we're doing, it was particularly useful to see specific reference to the issues around human rights and equality. The idea that there'd be no regression in terms of human rights and equality guarantees as a result of the, this process. But I suppose a concern uh, I would have at the moment is that even though there have been a number of commitments given, the language is open to a lot of interpretation. What does that mean in practice? And I suppose the bigger issue in relation to some of this is enforceability and implementation. So I think it's very clear that a lot of the hard work remains to be done in working through the precise detail of what has been agreed so far and making sure that that stands up in the longer term. I suppose an overall conclusion at this point for me is that There's a real risk that the trade 
issues, issues around trade, which are important and fundamental issues about the future relationship of the EU and the UK, that those dominate the conversation. Uh, and I think that would be a mistake because there are important human rights and equality consequences of leaving the European Union too. And there's a real risk that those are get, will get neglected. So I think it was useful to see the, the fairly clear references and guarantees and commitments given to that in the joint report. But I think it's very much work in progress. And I think a lot of the hard negotiating and hard work is still to be done on the detail as part of the phase two negotiations. It was interesting on that to see that that will go forward and continue to go forward in a separate strand, those conversations. So a lot more still to be done, I think. Yeah, there's a, I don't know, I, I kind of felt like there was a, maybe a feeling that there was, that this was it, that that was the deal finished and done from a lot of people, whereas it, it's kind of a, we're in a situation where we're now waiting to see what phase two will bring. Like this was only a, an agreement to move on to make another <laughs> agreement, yeah. essentially. Yeah. In my mind anyway, like I didn't take anything to be concrete, but, yeah. um, I was, I was quite reassured in a yeah. way to see the, the real tip of the hat to making sure that the ECJ jurisdiction mm-hmm. wasn't just thrown out the window, that that's really being you know, held as something that's, is quite crucial. And it, it, it really is, especially to, yeah. to your work yeah. on human rights. Yeah. Um, do you think that in the in a case where perhaps Northern Ireland wasn't bound by ECJ jurisdiction that we would see separate protections put in place along the same sort of lines but just under a different name or guise? Yeah. That's a very good point, you know. I think it's also important to bear in mind that there are limitations and time limitations around that written into that joint report, which in itself raises... Uh, worrying questions, but I think what it highlights is the issue of enforcement and implementation of some of the commitments. Because of the nature of the UK constitutional system, there are really hard questions raised about how some of the guarantees that are given in the report on Friday, how they are going to be enforced and implemented in practice. And we already saw over the weekend some references to the possibility in the future that the British people might decide to change some of this stuff, you know. So I think that's where a lot of hard thinking has to go, not just of having these rights on paper, but of enforcing them. I suppose the other thing to bear in mind about Northern Ireland, which I find a bit amusing about the conversations around this, is that you know Northern Ireland is also, is already supposed to enjoy a special constitutional status within the UK. That seems to me absolutely clear. It's what uh, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement was about. It's what a lot of things were about since. Uh, within the terms of the UK constitution itself, there's been a lot of devolution of power around the UK in quite, quite substantial terms in the last uh, number of years. So the sense in which uh, Northern Ireland already has a special constitutional status, I think was rather taken for granted. So it was rather surprising then to hear so many references to potential threats to UK constitutional integrity. That seemed to me to be misplaced. So in a sense, a lot of the hard work was around recognising the fact that this place already has special and unique things happening and that how do you protect those, including, I think, an important point that can get lost is the majority of people here voted to remain. So there are important guarantees in the agreement around how you avoid a hard border. There are a number of scenarios given, you know, the UK preference uh, for how to avoid that on a UK-wide basis, then specific solutions, and then the guarantee that there will be full alignment north and south. And I think, however, the real work now going forward is again designing the, the legal outcomes of all that, of making sure that that is all watertight, and that people can do something about it. So in a sense, you're absolutely right to raise the question of the Court of Justice of the European Union, because the important thing after this is what are people going to be able to do if uh, a future government or a future parliament decides it wants to backtrack on some of these commitments? That's equally a question for the EU, but also a big question for the Irish government in relation to the Good Friday Agreement issues too, because it is a co-guarantor with the UK government, and it's important that it is playing a fundamental role in checking these things and making these arguments. Do you think that 
So something I was struck by was that during the negotiations of the agreement that was sort of then derailed a little bit by the DUP initially, was that from from what I can tell, and you know, maybe maybe I'm I'm a little bit out here, yeah. but no politicians in Northern Ireland were consulted about the agreement, and I felt like it was it, it was it was just a bit strange to to have Northern Ireland's constitutional status debated by the Republic and the British governments without. Northern Ireland being considered, especially because I did want to bring up about the Northern Irish Remain vote as well, because I'm not sure how that factors into it, because I feel that perhaps you can shed a little more light. Do you think that there's a way for Northern Ireland to keep a special constitutional status without Scotland demanding something similar? And do you think there's a way for the whole of the UK to maintain regulatory alignment with Ireland whilst not being in the single market? Like, is that a, a possibility that is, has any merit whatsoever? Or is that sort of just very wishful thinking? No, I, I think it's important to bear in mind again the point about the, the unique circumstances uh, of this place. I think there's fairly widespread acceptance that Northern Ireland is is not just like Scotland, Wales, in a devolution conversation, that there's something unique, there's something that the, the word unique circumstances means unique circumstances. I think so. While Scotland and Wales have very, very legitimate concerns about what is happening, I think there are special things happening here reflected in the agreement and what's followed after that, that uh, you need a tailored, bespoke solution to that. I think that, 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 that's fairly clear. Obviously, the UK at the moment needs a proper cons- conversation about its own co- constitution because uh, what Brexit is revealing, it's revealing the tensions and strains within the current UK constitutional arrangements, which are plainly, I think, inadequate for handling a task uh, uh, like this. In terms of the situation for people here at the minute, let me be very, very clear. You know, the situation here is absolutely shocking because, um, you know, one of the elements of having a power sharing arrangement here is that there are very clear uh, mechanisms built in to ensure there's cross community support within the institutions that's built into the executive, that there are certain guarantees that are there. The situation at the moment means that people here are essentially left out of the picture. Um, we have a situation where we have power sharing cross community arrangements where one major political party, I would state it more, no more significantly than that, one major political party here, uh, sounds at times as if it's speaking for an entire society when it clearly is not. And I think even more disturbingly, it's a political party that is in a current arrangement with the, the government in London. So to have a situation where one of the major parties in this society in a very, very fragile constitutional architecture of cross-community power sharing is in that position. It is, it should be rightly deeply, deeply concerning to people here. There's a real risk and probably the biggest constitutional issue of our generation is going to be decided with very, very little input from people here. But let's also be clear in the one chance that people had to make their voices heard in terms of the referendum last year, clearly, on the question asked, most people here voted to remain. And I I think, given the unique circumstances of Northern Ireland, that is too lightly brushed aside in the the conversation. And I think that remains a real issue uh, in relation to the unique solutions and specific solutions that will be developed. So I don't think it is unfair for people to keep making that point. Well, that's nice to nice to hear. I get I get labelled yeah. a remoter yeah. at times by friends yeah. <laughs> for uh, for complaining yeah. that. Um, so I'm not yeah. sure if you saw on Nolan yeah. either last week or the week yeah. before. Jim Allister essentially yeah. said he yeah. gave yeah. a passing thought to the fact that Northern Ireland yeah. voted to remain. Yeah. So I was yeah. I was just baffled by that statement. Well, I think you make an, an important point. All we're really doing when we make when you make that point, is to point to the facts. And the facts, it's just a fact, you know, Northern Ireland 
voted to remain. But I suppose the bigger uh, worry that people should should have and reflect on is that you know so lightly casting aside the consent of a majority of people here uh, raises all sorts of questions that perhaps don't arise in other parts of the UK. You know, consent, albeit it has different meanings in different contexts and different meanings in terms of the agreement and all that, I think people should be worried that the idea of consent of the majority of people here so casually brushed aside. And, you know, I think many people here felt that the days in which a UK-wide unitary, UK-wide singular decision would determine our constitutional fate, the future generation had gone. I think people have been shocked. That to see that happen and to see that the issue of consent here seems to be almost meaningless in a conversation that's not happening. So would you say that this is almost a, a regression of devolution then in, in, in that sense? Well, obviously we don't have an executive and an assembly at, at the moment. I think it, it, it's about issues of paying attention to and proper regard to and respect for the arrangements that are in place here and they've been put in place since 1998. I think there's a lot of lip service being paid to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, but I wonder sometimes if people actually read it. <laughs> you know, I, I, I just I really wonder that those ideas of mutual respect, of partnership, of equality, at the heart of that, that agreement, you know, it's about respecting those, of applying those in practice, not just talking about them. And I think at the moment there's a real sense that that is not happening. I think that is a real sense that Westminster and Whitehall are plowing on. Um, but the, I suppose the other flip side of that is who would have thought, who who would have thought that as a result of Brexit, uh, the Good Friday Agreement would be back centre stage of a European-wide conversation about the future of this island. And I think perhaps that has, been, that has surprised the UK government um, and the Irish government and civil society here played a big role, you know, in making sure that that has happened. But I think it's, yes, note the Good Friday Agreement and its importance, but also apply the agreement mm. uh, and make sure its principles are reflected in what happens next. But I think it's perfectly legitimate for people to, to raise these issues. You know, this is going to affect us all. And future generations for, for, you know, and I think it's absolutely right that people raise it. And I don't like the way in which some of the public debate descends into basically personal abuse, which you can see in some of the responses to anybody who raises a hard question about the direction of travel within the UK. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, I don't know, maybe, maybe, uh, Maybe I'm in my little yeah. bubble. Of, yeah. I, I, I yeah. feel like my history and yeah. polyface teachers were quite... Maybe quite prescient yeah, yeah. in their uh, forcing us yeah. to read the Good yeah. Friday Agreement. Yeah. Maybe that's just yeah. you know what you need to yeah. do to understand where Northern yeah. Ireland's at yeah. in any context. But I feel like it's it's yeah. it's coming back to be to have been quite useful in in like okay. truly like yeah. having sort of read and and been forced to understand. Yeah. I say forced to yeah. understand. But, you yeah, know, trying no, to get, no, get right. your head around the ideas yeah. there. But you you talked about how you feel the constitutional arrangements for Northern Ireland are a little mm. bit inadequate mm. at the moment and the constitutional arrangements for the UK yeah. in general. Yeah. Um, now, the the issue was kind of put on the table during the election very briefly by Jeremy Corbyn mm. of a, the possibility of a federalised UK. Mm. Is that something you think would provide like a more of a framework for Northern Ireland to maintain a special status or do you think that that's not, maybe not the right route to go down? I think at the moment the, the, there's two things. One thing is about the agreement again. I, I think people need to return to the spirit of that agreement in the sense that it, as you know, you know, it thinks very deeply about relationships across these islands. So it's obviously got um, the institutions in relation to Northern Ireland, but there's a North-South arrangement, the North-South Ministerial Council and the implementation bodies. Mm. There's the East-West stuff, British-Irish Council and British-Irish Intergovernmental Conference. And I just wonder in the time ahead, do we need to be using some of those mechanisms a bit more than we currently are to promote conversations around these islands? You know, I think there's a risk that a purely UK internal conversation wouldn't speak to that wider Good Friday Agreement context. So I think there's part of me thinks use the agreement and it may be, I know there's some discussion at the moment 
uh, that the British Irish Intergovernmental Conference, for example, uh, in the agreement may re-emerge <laughs> in the new year if things don't get back on track uh, here. And certainly the Taoiseach has been raising that, you know, as, as an issue. So that's, you know, the British and Irish governments talking to each other about the future of this place. I suppose the second limit to this, you're, you're right, you know, and if you look at the EU withdrawal bill going through Parliament at the moment, and obviously the vote last night that the government lost in relation to that, um, that raises really hard questions about whether the UK intergovernmental structures within the UK, the way in which Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales and Westminster talk to each other, and Whitehall talk to each other, whether they're really fit for purpose. And I think they're not. And so that does invite a conversation about the UK's constitution. I think that's a long overdue conversation. I think the structures at the moment are not fit for purpose. Um, I think many people around the UK, particularly here in Scotland and Wales, felt that the UK constitution had moved radically on. It moved well beyond command and control from Whitehall or Westminster, albeit some of the basics of UK constitutional law might suggest otherwise. And so I think there is a need for a conversation. But the, the problem I have at the moment, right, the question I have myself is, How do you start that conversation, Mm -hmm. given the levels and the lack of trust around the UK between the various institutions and arrangements where they're operational? How would you start the conversation? Where would you even begin? So, for example, the the reference, I think the Labour Party talking about a constitutional convention to to, to initiate this Mm -hmm. discussion. How do you start that conversation? How do you get people to show up, Mm -hmm. Right. In, in the, the the lack of trust within the current uh, UK arrangements is quite stark, but I think you're right. Um, people need to be thinking whatever people want to do in the future, whether Scotland wants to leave, whether Northern Ireland joins with the rest of Ireland. The the mechanisms certainly for Northern Ireland are are there, right? They're guaranteed they're there uh, in uh, the agreement and what has followed, but. If you want the thing to work, you know, as it is now, I think you need a, a sort of grown up conversation about that, you know, simply to make the thing work and operate. Like, I think there are issues arising out of this withdrawal bill of capacity, whether the current arrangements are really uh, fit for purpose, whether they'll be able to cope. So I think it's a good, great question. Well, I, I feel like the, the, co- <laughs> part of me feels like that if, if we do end up with a, a Labour government at mm-hmm. some point, that they're going to be, Riding in on their yeah. wave of yeah. I don't know, quote unquote radicalism, yeah. and that their kind of enthusiasm to change the way things are will probably drive forward conversations yeah. that are maybe a bit stagnant and a bit kind yeah. of I don't know what the, what better way to put it, but just things that not, people don't feel they like can discuss that that, that yeah. sort of atmosphere of of change brings about yeah. the ability to have those conversations. Yeah. Something I've been thinking about yeah. quite a lot recently is whether the Good Friday Agreement and the St Andrews Agreement and the, all the structures yeah. that were put in place yeah. around them in order to produce a yeah. power-sharing government, yeah. whether they whether we have an adequate response to just impasse, the, the, the sort of discourse yeah. that we were at, the discord that we're at now, where yeah. we've had was it 11 months, yeah. 11 months, no government. Yeah. Coming up on 12, was it January of last year that Martin McGuinness resigned? To the start of January? Yeah. So, essentially, I've been listening to um, this journalist, uh, Ezra Klein in America, talking about whether America had an adequate response for just making the wrong choice for president. Like, whether they had a way to just... Something that wasn't impeachment. Something that was, like, what what, what if this person just isn't fit for purpose? And I've been kind of trying to tr- trying to think about our current situation in a in a similar yeah. way. I'm trying to get my head around whether Northern Ireland, because our system that we have in the minute is, I think, really, really fantastically designed. Mm. Like we have the most representative elections in the UK with um, PRSDV, which I think is really, really admirable. It mm. means that. Parties like Alliance and the and the Greens get um, representation where they just wouldn't in first yeah. past the post. Like, yeah. look at our yeah. Westminster map; it's just Sinn Fein DUP, yeah. and we have a situation that allows 
power sharing through um, Dahon and mm. consociationalism. Mm. And that's a mouthful. Yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> but, uh, but it, it, there's some really fantastic mechanisms in there to provide a way for a divided society to govern. Yeah. But we've we seem to have hit this wall where we can't get past. And the only, the only way that I see at the moment, like as a legitimate way to move past where we're at is, is an idea that that I've been, I've been chatting to a couple of people about is a citizens assembly for Northern Ireland. And I, I wanted to, to see if you felt that that would be an adequate way to deal with our, our, so our uh, impasse at Stormont and our the constitutional conversation that we need to have in the context of, of Brexit. No, again, that 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 that's a great question. I my, my my sense is that some at some stage we're we're going to have to get back into a sense in this society to the power sharing institutions that we have in place, and people will have to return to those structures at some point. I do think um, that they've shown capacity to rethink those, to evolve, uh, but that's where we stand the best chance of having the sort of you know discussions that will lead to meaningful long-term change in this society. The difficulty is Brexit has absolutely uh, destabilised that situation. It has sent people... Uh, back to a sort of fearful, anxious positions uh, constitutionally, which are utterly understandable, I think. But at some point, we all have to come back to the institutions that are there. But I think you're absolutely right. We also have to remember about the things, as we think about 20 years off of the agreement next year, that haven't been delivered, the area that I work in. You know, a lot of people feel very, very strongly some of the human rights and equality and social justice commitments have simply not been delivered, you know, in a very tangible way. Things that were promised haven't happened. Uh, in fact, you know, recently last year, we were looking as if the whole discourse of human rights was being airbrushed out of the picture, perhaps for, you know, political convenience. And the big one, you're right, you know, the agreement also talks about let's not forget a civic forum. You know, the idea of civic society who played a leading role, really, in doing the heavy lifting of peace building. Very many people around the society whose names you will never hear, right, Mm -hmm. Uh, who won't get invited to some of the big conferences that happen here next year, do the heavy lifting around peace. And there are voices from civil society who are doing hard work peace building. You're absolutely right. I think those voices need to be heard and we need to be thinking about innovative ways to try and do that. We almost needed the moment a new initiative from civil society to begin to to think through the sort of vision for the next 20 or 30 years in this place. But in doing that, we mustn't forget that the original agreement does envisage you know, a civic forum, does envisage a lot of civic engagement and does recognise the role of civil society here. But I think where we're at now does require some innovative thinking, mainly because I think, as you rightly pointed out earlier, you know, people are being literally silenced. You know, to, to, to put it in, you know, cross community terms at the moment, and people can argue about the rights and wrongs of what's happening in Westminster. At the moment, one section of this community is completely silenced effectively in that debate. Well, the DP has what, 26% of the assembly vote? Mm-hmm. Roughly some, something yeah. around that. So they are speaking for the whole of the country, which is. <laughs> so I, I think you're right. I think it, it, there, there's a desperate need for, um, I think, a wider civic initiative. You know, it's certainly an area that I work most in, which is around rights and equality issues. There is a very, very tangible sense of, I would put it as strongly as anger, you know, that that many of the ambitions, many of the, the hopes and dreams of the agreement 1998 have not been realised um, and that that remains work in progress. So I think that civic initiatives which are highlighting the work yet to be done, thinking of innovative ways forward, uh, are desperately needed. Absolutely. 
honestly, I feel like the best argument for it is to yeah. just take a look at, at, at Belfast or, yeah. or Northern Ireland as a yeah. whole. Yeah. Like it's a it's a city that's that's really like transformed yeah. in the past. Like even yeah. in the past five years since I started university, yeah. um, when I when I first came to Queens, <laughs> it's it's. And it's the people that have really like moved on and and, and made it the place that it yeah. is now. And I think yeah. it's it, it it seems only fitting to allow the the, the people to yeah. to sort out the yeah. things that the politicians yeah. um, aren't able to to sort out. But I, I, I that's an interesting point, right? But and we flip it over a bit, right? In terms of um, and I understand what you're saying, but. Let's think about it the other way. You've talked about the inclusive nature of the voting system here, right? Um, we've had two elections this year in which the people of the society have spoken mm-hmm. twice, mm-hmm. you know, so in a sense, and there's been no lack of clarity about the message that they have sent, you know, so, and, and that's why I think that, um, getting back to the institutional architecture that we have to manage that is, is important because I do think um, there is an element of wishful thinking around some of the debates around, you know, that the people are somehow in a different place from where the, but the people have had mm. an awful lot of chances to express their democratic wishes, in fact, twice this year. <laughs> and so they've spoken in a sense about where they're at, you know, so I think it's a, a sense in which Getting the institutions back and operational is an important point, but none of that's to undermine or the the absolute centrality of civic society in trying to point out the the, the things that haven't been done to try and avoid the conversations becoming too backslappy, complacent about what a wonderful peace process we have. <laughs> to remind people that that stuff hasn't been done. That for many people in the society in the last twenty years, things have not tangibly changed. Uh, in terms of socioeconomic status. For example, this city that we're living in, the people, their, their children whose scripts for their lives are being written still based on where they happen to be born in this city. Mm-hmm. I think that's shocking 20 years on from the agreement. And very many of those children are being born into parts of the city that are most heavily affected by the conflict. And if their lives aren't changing, then there's something profoundly wrong. I think you're right. We, we need to be doing something about that. So. You mentioned about the elections. Do you think, uh, I don't know how much, not legitimacy, because obviously yeah. that's, that's democracy. Yeah. Like that's, that's yeah. the, you know, the best of a, a bad bunch of systems. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the idea that I feel that a lot of people maybe go into the voting booth, especially with the fears being raised around the fundamental ideas of, of identity in Northern Ireland especially become the sole focus of the electorate when we go into the voting booth whether that's we need to feel we need to defend it or we want to vote for someone who they don't think about politics in that mm-hmm. context be that mm-hmm. the Green Party or the Alliance or, mm-hmm. or then if you mm-hmm. want to you know, vote your community essentially. You can vote DUP yeah. or, or Sinn Fein, but I, I'm at a point where I'm struggling to see where. So I, I have a theory that if you went down onto the streets of Belfast yeah. and asked a hundred yeah. people if the 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 MLAs deserved their salary yeah. right now, they'd all yeah. say no. Yeah. That you would be really struggling to find someone yeah. who said yes. Yeah. They are doing work yeah. that they deserve to be for. Yeah. My, my mum's yeah. a nurse, and yeah. I've mentioned about this yeah. before in the podcast. Yeah. She is endlessly yeah. furious yeah. that they're getting paid. Yeah. And I understand their frustration. Yeah. Like, they're obviously still doing some constituency yeah. work yeah. And, and bits and pieces, but like, you, I really do understand her frustration. Mm. I don't see electoral consequences for a lack of governing. Mm. The DUP, yes, they lost seats, yeah. or lost, sorry, not yeah. seats, they lost the, a percent they lost yeah. a percentage of their vote share for the first time in, in in about 20 years i think it was in the last assembly election but there's i don't know i feel like there's still no movement and we're kind of in, entrenched in a way where you get into that voting booth and you have several options you can choose not to confront the idea of identity yeah. in yeah. as the the sole issue or you can you can vote dup or Sinn Féin. and i feel that giving 
a forum to people to discuss many, many options and, and lots of different ideas yeah. is more flexible than the position that the two main parties are in themselves, just sort of pointing the pointing a gun at each other's head, essentially, with neither can compromise at the risk of looking soft to the other side. Yeah. And it's, you know, the, the tension sort of ratchets up and ratchets up. And, and, and I feel that, I don't know, we need something else to, yeah. to, to, to bring that those levels down again to yeah. the point where we can actually, like, have a discussion about it. Yeah. No, I, I don't think any of that is either or. You know, I, I think there is, you're right, you know, a sense that there, there's a need for some kind of civil society initiative, a citizen assembly or whatever one term to, to, to begin to hear a range of voices around this. Like one of the things that worries me at the moment in working area human rights is that I'm interested in human rights of everyone in this society. And so that, and that means everyone. And I think one of the issues for the future in this society will be the impact of Brexit on minority ethnic communities and new communities here. Um, and I'm quite worried about that, about racial discrimination, racial profiling on this island. So we need to be including the voices of everyone in those conversations and hearing. But I think a civic society initiative would be very, very welcome. But I don't think it's either or. It's a combination of that and getting our institutions back up and running. I'm going to say a really unpopular thing. You know, at, now, I, I actually think my fear at the moment is people becoming disillusioned with the idea of public service and public life. I think politicians, by and large, most of them work quite hard. They do an awful lot of hard work on scene and seen. Um, and it's very often a thankless job serving the public. And the public can be fickle as well in terms of their own, uh, what they expect of politicians and then what. So uh, I'm not a politician. I can say that out loud, right? But, uh, <laughs> but I do think, the, the, the big risk in modern life, I think, is that people get really, really disillusioned with the idea of public service, of public life, of going into public life, of politics as a noble pursuit mm. to try and reshape this place. Um, and that would be desperate for here, I think, because, you know, if we ever do get regional power back, we need people to be reshaping this place, you know, very, very, very radically and to step into those spaces. But you're abs absolutely right as well about civic pride. There's an awful amount in the cities and towns around this place of civic pride in the locality that people are in. Mm. And often there's small initiatives happening in those areas that reflect that. So I think it's about harnessing that too as well, you know. But the main thing for me is that the, the way the, the, the public conversation sometimes goes, it promotes, you know, real cynicism about public, anybody who steps into public life. Uh, and I, I worry that that's putting a whole generation of people who could transform this place, you know, off and go off and do other things. So I think we have to be fair to the politicians, right? They've stepped up to the plate. People can vote them in or out, whatever. Many of them are very, very hardworking, particularly on constituency stuff. Mm. It perhaps doesn't seem so well to people. And so I think we need to encourage more people to participate and get involved. If people are unhappy, get involved, change mm. it, start new initiatives, start new parties, do new things. You know, I think about the Good Friday Agreement next year. One thing that recently watched the documentary about the Women's Coalition here, of a group of women who came together to try and transform this place to have an impact on the negotiations, you know. And I think that's the sort of spirit you know, we need. And there's a lot of that around, you know, but it's just harnessing it. Yeah, it definitely is. It's uh, people from Northern Ireland and love, love the country. Like, they, they, they might hate the country, but they, they love the country. <laughs> um, they, it's, it, we're, I, I think you're right. It's a, it's a place where we do, we have a lot of pride in where we come from, but it, it, there's maybe a bit of disconnect between that, that pride and, and, and where that, that takes us kind of politically. Yeah. I, uh, I think that's what, you know, I think we can't ignore the reality of the sort of ethno national, the user division that's here. I think people are divided, right? And I, I don't think you can wash that away or pretend that away, but, but we've tried to create institutions and structures and design things to to recognize that and then build a society based around that 
but that transforms that as well in the process. And the problem was, however inadequate, and it was inadequate and flawed, and it wasn't doing a lot of things that I wanted to be doing in terms of human rights and equality issues, um, however inadequate that was, it's better than the current situation we're now in, you know, which uh, you know is really, really profoundly shocking, where we have a profound deficit at the heart of our arrangements when the biggest decision you know, in fact our, is now going forward and we're effectively voiceless. Yeah. And I think that is really, really, truly shocking. Mm. might be a little melodramatic, but I, I felt a little bit like Poland during the Nazi-Soviet pact. <laughs> 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 You know, just two two larger powers arguing it out over who's going to get what. <laughs> um, well, I think the other thing about the British Irish situation, which is you know worth noting as well, is that you know the both governments have a big responsibility in this place, but they're both fragile governments. You know, they're both minority governments mm-hmm. held in place by confidence and supply agreements. Mm-hmm. You know, so well, um, Moretta Carr is enjoying yeah. a little bit of a bounce. Yeah, absolutely, and. Um, I'm not. I'm, I'm honestly consistently baffled by the mm. polls and for the whole of the UK. Mm. Um, high on earth, mm. the Conservative government is still polling at forty percent. Mm. Just, I have no idea no. whether the models are wrong. Whether I'm just completely misjudging how how they're handling mm. things. Mm. Whether people are that terrified <laughs> of a Labour government, I I don't know what it is, but. They're still not. In the, they're not. I'd say they're slightly more fragile than yeah. than Ireland are right now. And maybe people are just. Mm. The, there's, there's been there has been a little bit of a bounce for the Conservatives, and perhaps it's that people would prefer a softer Brexit, and maybe that's like the reality for for most of the people in the UK who have mm. kind of. I don't know, reluctantly or not, accepted yeah. Yeah. the result of the referendum and gone. Okay, we need to make the best of this yeah. um the the irish border issue is is one that's you yeah. know obviously causing a lot yeah. of yeah uh a lot of problems and um, uh, we spoke to kitty hayward yeah. dr yeah. kitty hayward on this podcast yeah. actually um a few months back about the irish border issue yeah. and about how politicians needed to be a little more honest yeah. about what it meant um sort of in a, in a UK wide yeah. context, but I was curious as to yeah. whether you thought the that Brexit made a United Ireland inevitable in a way, whether it sort of condemned Northern Ireland to a failed state, as I've seen several yeah. people um, write, or or whether this yeah. is sort of something that just needs to be, you know, re- adapted and, and, and yeah. sort of renewed as an idea. I think on that, there are a number of things just to really stress at the moment. One is, I think, Brexit transforms the question for me around that that issue, right? It transforms the question into a question that is radically different from the way that the argument about unity has been presented in the past. We're now moving into a situation where... Uh, at that border becomes an external border of the European Union. Mm. The UK is out and Ireland is in. And I think that creates a, a different dynamic. I, I'm one of those people who have argued that it is perfectly credible to make the case for giving people a choice to remain in one union by leaving another, mm. I, to remain in the European Union by leaving the UK. Now, that sometimes invites a reaction, right, in saying that out loud. But what troubles me is the reaction to that for this reason, that the, the consent principle, the constitutional arrangements, the mechanisms for doing that are a normal standard part of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. It was tortuously negotiated over, you know, decades, the formulation of words, etc. And it's 20, there. 22, yeah. 22 years after Sunningdale? Yeah, was it something deal was seventy six, right? Am I wrong? Well, I think that the the point just bear it's it's a long time yeah. in working out this formulation of words, right? And um, and it's central to the agreement, and it's there and it's established. Now people talk about consent and the importance, and I agree with that. Consent here, it's clearly locked in consent in Northern Ireland and a vote in the South as well. 
But if, you know, the constitutional status of this place only rests on the consent of a majority of people here and within the city as well, then what's, what is the problem mm. with periodically asking people, right? <laughs> You know, there's a seven year rule in the, uh, in the Northern Ireland Act, but, um, why not? I, it, it baffles me. And I think the worrying thing is at some stage, uh, that question will be asked, right? At some stage, we will have this poll, we'll have a referendum. And I think we urgently need to normalize the language around it. Otherwise, you know, we're not respecting an absolutely core principle of, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and what's been agreed between British Ireland governments as well. And I think sometimes when I listen to the arguments in response to that, it makes me really nervous. Mm-hmm. You know, is this place really constitutional status only based on consent? What are people actually saying here? What is looming behind some of these arguments? So there's that. But I think the pre- and that is all secured and tied down and the mechanisms are. But I think the major issue at the moment is getting a specific solution that reflects the unique circumstances of this place. That's where the hard work is. That's where the effort should be. There's a mechanism for doing the Irish unity thing. It'll happen at some point. Not, you know, whatever people vote one way or the other, but the poll will happen at some point. And we just need to get used to that. That'll happen. Um, but at the moment, the priority issue has to be fine-tuning, working out a unique set of arrangements that reflect the particular circumstances of this place. You know, and again, I wouldn't overstate how or that, you know, this place already is supposed to have. It already has a number of special things going on here. So it's about reflecting that in Brexit. Mm. But I think there will be a border poll at some stage in Irish unity. I think the mechanisms are there. That's all tied down. There's no confusion about that. Um, that'll happen. Uh, but I do think Brexit changes that quite radically. You know, mm. we could be, you know, on this island, you know, uh, facing across the border of the European Union and to a member state of the European Union that is thriving you know, mm-hmm. while we follow the UK mm-hmm. and to who knows where, you know, and people on this island potentially drift further and further apart. I think the hard border issue is absolutely, you know, I'm somebody I'm from the Northwest, from Derry, and, you know, I'm very, very used to that idea of the invisible frictionless border up there. People are leading complicated lives around the border. I think it would be disastrous if that was to return in any form. But again, there are ways to avoid that, you know. And this agreement, the joint report was reached on Fridays, you know, locks that down in principle at least. We'll see what happens in time ahead. Um, I had two questions actually there on what you said. Uh, first of all, why do you think there's such resistance to the idea of even holding a border poll? Do you think it's fear of the result or do you think it's fear of confronting the idea or do you think it's you know, sort of just oh you know don't be silly Northern Ireland is Northern Ireland like, well, where do you think that sort of I think there's a resistance m- comes m- from? multiple reactions isn't there I think the you know we've seen some of those reactions already and some of them can be quite sort of sharp you know in terms of the idea I think the worry that people have is that um, it might be divisive, you know, and people will retreat into, you know, very sort of comfortable zones in terms of debate. Um, that worries me because, um, and the reason it worries me is because all around Europe now, people are repeating this standard line about the Good Friday Agreement. Well, people need to read the Good Friday Agreement. It's absolutely at the core of that document. Uh, the basis of this society, the constitutional status of this society at the moment, rests on consent. And for the life of me, I do not understand. If you accept the agreement and what's followed, what is exactly the problem with periodically testing democratic consent? Mm-hmm. And if people are so sure of the outcome, what's the problem? Anyway, so I think there's there's an urgent need to, in civil society and for leaders around this island and these islands to simply normalise the conversation in that loose terms. Mm. Um, all the parties keep talking about consent in various ways. Well, how do you, do you just assume people consent? Mm. You know, you have to ask them. And so the idea and the agreement is you ask people. And uh, I, I just really do not see the issue with that. I do think Brexit changes the conversation from some of the older nationalistic arguments about Ireland 
uh, to a more and a different conversation mm. about the sort of, you know, for example, what does it mean to live in the island of Ireland in 2017 as opposed to 1966 or whatever, you know? It's a very, very different, more pluralistic Ireland, mm. you know? So I think exiting the EU debate changes that question. And that's, you know, to be too... Some of the language, some of around Brexit, some of the stuff about taking back control, some of the exclusionary terminology makes me wonder, do I really want to be part of it? You know, what sort of values mm. do we want to reflect here? So whatever people think about the Irish Unity debate, the Brexit debate, all that, I think back to your point about a civic society initiative, whatever your views on all that and all the mechanisms are there, we need a conversation in this society about the sort of values that we want to reflect into the future. And I think that's why you know, you're thinking about civil society type mechanism for that. It's important to have a values-based conversation in areas like, for example, immigration and asylum. Do, do people in Northern Ireland really want to follow the Home Office mm. and Westminster down an ever more restrictive and unwelcoming line in relation to people from other parts of the world? I think we... No, that's complicated by the fact that's an accepted matter at the minute in terms mm. of legally. But I think, does that stop us here, having a civic society initiative or another initiative to say, you know, what sort of society do we want to be? Does that really suit us? Is that where we want to go? Honestly, if I was the DUP or if I was a, you know, like a staunch unionist, mm. I would probably be pushing for that border poll to be taken as soon as possible. Because <laughs> just with with your with your sort of mention of yeah. it's exiting one union to join another, yeah. I feel like I feel like a hard border is a lot more inevitable than people yeah. maybe yeah. give it give it kind of unless there's there's a lot sort of hashed out and I feel like there's almost an inevitability of some sort of border somewhere. Just because immigration became such a central part of the of the referendum, and the four freedoms are are, are indivisible, and we have we there has to be something yeah. essentially, and yeah. where where that is and what yeah. that entails is obviously very open to what happens in the next eighteen yeah. months. But I, I feel that the the economic, at least in the short term, results of of the the, the Brexit. I don't know what you want to call it, deal or, yeah. or situation. Yeah. Absolutely. Are would almost cause people to, yeah. to, to begin to look at that question in a far more yeah. economic way. Yeah. Rather than especially if, if you know the South continues to yeah. to grow its economy and, and, and recover in the way it has yeah. from the, the two thousand eight yeah. crash. Yeah. I, I feel that that almost makes it a lot more a lot more likely for there yeah. to be enough people who are sat in the middle because there's about 80% of society yeah. I don't think their yeah. mind will change yeah. Yeah. but that that 20% in the middle yeah. that are maybe wavering and, and not yeah. that worried yeah. either way they just yeah. want what's best for yeah. themselves for their family for, for you know the yeah. place they want to yeah. live yeah. I, I would be pushing for it as soon as possible before we see the results yeah. of the yeah. um of the of the next sort of eighteen months, but you know perhaps we need to wait. Uh, the, the last thing I, I yeah. sort of want to ask yeah. you was yeah. what you thought was going to happen with the Good Friday Agreement, yeah. sort of with Northern Ireland constitutionally, and you know what you thought we we uh, we will be seeing in the next eighteen months, yeah. next two years. What's I, I think that back to earlier question as well. I think first thing is that you know. We have to share this island and we have to share these islands, right? And so the important thing about the Good Friday Agreement for me was that it, it, it thought in relational terms about all these relationships. It didn't just think about Northern Ireland, it thought about the island and these islands. And Brexit requires us to find that spirit again. I think we need that sort of thinking. And it did so within the context of the EU. The EU is textually present in the agreement. You can see the references there. You can see it in relation to the North-South Ministerial Council, for example. So I think it's there. But I think we need that sort of thinking in terms of the agreement again. The institutions, but for me also the values 
you know, when people read the agreement, just look how many references there are to human rights. And I emphasize rights, but also human rights in that agreement and also equality issues. So I think it had a values-based framework for thinking about institutions and relationships across these islands. So I'm glad that people are referring to it everywhere again. Now, I think the EU-wide endorsement for the agreement, they need to apply it and use it. I think that's the answer for me to the question and subsequent agreements as well. But I think that's the answer to some of the questions that we're talking about. Use the agreement. Um, I think there are hard questions ahead about the details of this, about what will be in the withdrawal agreement. Remember, the Good Friday Agreement is also British-Irish agreement and binding international legal uh, treaty between those two states to which they're both bound. You know, so when they're negotiating this stuff, I think we have to remember the international legal components to that too. And, for example, will the agreement end up in the withdrawal agreement? In some way, a reference, its mechanisms, how will that be enforced? A lot of hard questions to come. But I suppose the answer to the question is really that we need to get back, <laughs> in a sense, to the sort of spirit that brought around the agreement itself. And we need to work that spirit and the institutions. And that will bring us back at some point to facing the fact we have to share this society together and we have to share this island together and these islands together. And I think the agreement and what followed gave us you know, some of the tools to do that, but it also gave us the values to build that around. My worry, 20 years on from the Good Friday Agreement, I'll be saying this next year as well, you know, and all the events, though, is that the values bit has been rather forgotten, and particularly the values around human rights and equality. And I think there's a real risk in the last number of years that they were being written out of the script. And I think that they need to be brought back much more firmly so as you, you build a sh- shared society on some kind of firm foundation, so respect for people's rights. Uh, and I think that's been missing. So I think that, for me, is a guide to where we might go. I think there are real challenges ahead, but in realising some of that. Would you think the, the anniversary kind of might end up giving a little bit of new life, like combined with the sort of resurgence of the Good Friday Agreement amongst discussions because of Brexit? Do you think that, plus the anniversary, would could give us more, give it a bit of a, a new lease of life? I think that's a great question. Do, do you? I wonder you think, did the British government realise, right, <laughs> in Brexit, that it would lead to this mass EU-wide escalation of interest in the agreement? You know, I think it's one of, been one of the most remarkable aspects of this discussion to see the extent to which at EU level and Irish government and others all talking about this document. So there's been a real renewal of interest in it. It's been a massive sort of boost to the thing itself. But I think what people will find next year you know, for the events that might happen here, there'll be a lot of, you know, soul searching and reflection about where we actually are 20 years on. And I think a lot of hard questions around the promises not being delivered. So I don't think a lot of those things will be celebrations. Of 20, there'll be profound soul searching and reflection about where we are. And I think you might risk as well a slight mismatch, you know, all these references document, but people saying, well, the thing isn't being Right, you know, some of the stuff hasn't happened. Some of the civic initiatives we've talked about have gone. You know, so um, I think there'll be hard questions too next year. So and a lot of thinking about how we can still reflect some of those values and the arrangements that we have. Well, hopefully, we manage to hold things together. Yeah. That's all we can hope for. You know, things don't completely break down. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks very much. Well, thank you for time, much, Colin. Josh, that's great. Uh, thank you. Really enjoyed it. Right. a lot thank you very much I might have to, to go back and dig out my notes from, from A level on the Good Friday Agreement and, and give it another read absolutely <laughs> thanks so much for listening if you enjoy the show don't forget you can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter you can subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts and generally spread the word about the amazing podcast that you just listened to until next time thanks for listening